We're in our Family Blueprint series, and we're learning how to build a family the way God intended it. And uh, in order to build a family, you uh, have to have a couple come together, right, and get married. And um, I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about who do godly people marry? Now, I know that we have a different demographic in this room than we do the first service. And um, I just wanna let you know that young people, there's a lot of different things that's being said on, on uh, marriage and family and who you should date and marry. Could I just ask you, and not just young people, but singles, okay? Anyone who's single in the room? Who's single and ready to mingle? Hey, no, sir. I hope to help you today. I do, I really do. Uh, <laughs> that was funny, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was funny. I, 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 I don't know, I don't have anything after that. I'm sorry. Okay. Before we get into marriage next week, I want to talk about who do we marry as godly people. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that if you're single, if you're young, okay, whatever it may be, you haven't started that journey yet, that this helps you uh, find the person that God intended you for you to find. And I'm just asking that you would allow me to speak. And if I sound old school today, just so you know, old school still works. Okay, the Bible still works. All right. Okay, and um, so here's, here's the answer and we can leave, okay? Uh, who should a godly person date and marry? A godly person. Yay! And we're going to get into what does a godly person look like. Uh, married couples, hang on. We're going to get to us next week. Um, and just, you know, consider the fact, though, that if you have kids, if you have grandkids, um, you know, consider what we can take for notes to help and guide them as well. Believers are to seek out and marry believers, not unbelievers. This has been God's standard from the beginning. So the married couple who is faithful to love God would raise children who are also faithful to love God. And by God's grace, some have married unbelievers and that spouse eventually comes around to the Lord. And that's the exception to the rule. But this series is about learning and following God's intended design from the beginning for your marriage and for building your family. Not using your blueprints, but using God's blueprints. Not using the world's blueprints, but using God's blueprints, the word of God. So we're gonna go to 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 to see what God's word says about who we should marry and I just want to back what I'm saying up with Scripture. And it's in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. And on the screen will be the NIV version. And then I'm going to read the NLT after this. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. The word yoke is referring, let me just stop right there, is referring to uh, a harness or a block of wood that would go over two animals, two oxen. Um, and basically they would plow the ground together. And so what he's saying here is, and this is from the Old Testament teaching as well, that you don't mix an ox with a donkey because they're gonna fight over which way to go. True, true story. So do not be yoked together with unbelievers. That harness, you should not be in a, in a, in a harness or in a, in a relationship together with another with a person who is not a believer is what he's actually trying to teach here. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Did you know that you have the presence of God living in you today as a believer? That's, that's a sacred thing. That's a sacred uh, truth that we need to consider. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Isn't that encouraging? That he'll live among us through his Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Here's what the NLT version says. How many know marriage is a team? Amen. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, this scripture is not saying that you can't live in this world and that you have to completely not talk to your neighbors and your coworkers, right? We all know that's not what the scripture's teaching, right? This is referring to being in a intimate, personal relationship with someone. And obviously the best example, first of all, is marriage, but can also deal with other things like being best friends at times can be problematic if you are a believer and you're doing everything with an unbeliever, that can pull you away from God. This was the point. The point is this, that if we, if we get into intimate, personal relationships with someone else that is not a believer, they are going to hurt your relationship with God or pull you away. Now, sometimes we're able to pull those people into the kingdom of God, but this is not what God intended from the beginning. In Genesis 6, we actually see that Noah is building an ark and God's going to flood the earth because sin was so rampant. Guess what that sin, where that sin came from? It came from other nations. Okay, so God's people, so the line of Adam and Eve, all right, is being in a covenant with God. Let me explain this real quick. Adam and Eve were in a covenant with God in a relationship with him and their line of children started marrying worldly children from other nations. And so because of that, wickedness spread even into God's people. So one scholar says this, the line of the serpent, the devil, so ungodly, worldly people started marrying Seth's line or God's line through Adam and Eve. Are we following me on that? Because of that, wickedness run rampant. God chose to preserve a remnant, and that was Noah and his family from dying so he could start over, all right? Now, it's a problem again, and God knows it's gonna happen. So he says in Deuteronomy chapter seven, and he's, let me give you this one, because I, I need to read this, because unfortunately people misinterpret this scripture, and, and it's not good. People grossly pick one verse out, and and they make it about a racial thing and not a religious thing. Uh, verse, verse one of Deuteronomy seven. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, he will clear away many nations ahead of you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you, and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them, make no treaties with them, and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters. And people stop right there. And they misinterpret the scripture and they don't say why. This is not about interracial marriages, this is about intermarriage with other nations who, of people who worship false gods, okay? So let me clarify, because people stop at verse three and don't read verse four. For they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols. See, this wasn't about race, this was about religion. For you are a holy people, same language that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 6, who belong to the Lord your God. 
Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. So God is not against interracial marriage at all. God is for it. God is not for us marrying unbelievers. That's God's standard. And let's get into that, okay? Uh, God's standard is this. A godly marriage requires unity around God. Therefore, we should not be yoked with an unbeliever in our dating or premarital relationship. Now, this standard was a non-negotiable in God's eyes, and it was a non-negotiable in my home growing up, just so you know. So my parents, if, if they were old school, where their old school uh, ways worked, all right? And this, you know, this is how it happened. The standard was if I liked a girl, and I told my parents, or they found out, <laughs> which, you know, that's another conversation, my parents would ask me one simple question. It was the one question that mattered most. Does she have a relationship with God? Notice I said relationship with God, not church. Implying is she a true believer, a true Christian, a God-fearing woman or girl at this time? Is she a Christ follower? Does she love God? So I, just so you know, young people, parents did not pay me to preach the sermon today. <laughs> I'm just covering scripture, okay? And we're covering through this series because we, if we're going to build a godly family, it needs to start the right way, okay? And so why is this standard critical? Well, let's remember why we're here. We're here to glorify God. God created us. We belong to him. We're meant to enjoy a, a fellowship with him, a relationship with him, and also to show who he is to the world, okay? Then when you get married to someone who has the same ambition and focus, together when you're married, you both can show the world what it looks like to have a relationship with God through your marriage. And then when you have kids, you get to show the world what a family looks like, what it looks like to be in the family of God. And you get to show the world who God is and hopefully they see the salt and light of God. They see the light of Jesus Christ and they want Jesus too. Your family is supposed to attract unbelievers into the kingdom of God so they have everlasting life. That is the simple, basic purpose of a godly family. Oh, I thought it was so, you know, we can take trips to the Caribbeans every week and, and well, those are fun things we get to do, but every week, did I say every week? Man, I gotta get to know you. What do you, what do, you do? No. Take, you know, do all these fun things. Yeah, you know, have a, uh, like I said last week, you know, have a house, you know, white picket fence, perfect life, yada, yada, yada. Those are things we, we get to enjoy life while we're here. But the main reason why you're here right now is to be in relationship with God and help other people do the same thing. That's it. And it's awesome. And it's good. And I'm sorry if, if, if you didn't know that and you're just learning that, th this is the way it was supposed to be. And if God, and here's the second reason why this is critical. So that's the main thing. That's the main reason why we have godly families. Secondly, is someone who's a godly person has God in their life first. Like God is first in their life. All right? And so with that said, that matters who you marry because how you raise your kids and whether you agree on salvation in Jesus Christ what about water baptism, how we should worship, how we should handle money, you know, what kind of home we should get, where we should live, what's, what's our purpose in life? All of that needs to be agreed upon in the marriage between the man and the woman. And imagine marrying someone who doesn't agree with you. Let me give you an example. I've run into this, and I've heard this. Well, I'm gonna, let my, I'm gonna let my daughter choose who she's gonna worship. I'm not gonna force Jesus on her. I'll let her choose which religion she's gonna focus on. What do you do when you marry someone and that's the way your husband or wife thinks? And you're like, wait, what? I thought you were a Christian. This is, this is happening, my friends. 
So now, uh, they're, the teaching going on in homes is, well, there's many ways to God. There's not just one way. Last time I checked, the Bible says John, in John 14, 6, I, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man shall see the Father except through me. No man has eternal life except through Jesus. This is what's going on in marriage counseling, and, and sometimes it's a crisis. And that, I'm just scratching the surface. There's a lot of issues with this. And so this is why it's critical that we know who we are dating or who we are befriending and going through a dating process and marrying because you might be broadsided by their beliefs later on. And then that brings the, the number, th number three for me on the critical, why this is critical, and, and this is really a challenge, is we're living in a society where, where someone says they're a Christian, but they're not. Where we've watered down the definition of what it means to be a Christian or to be godly. And because of that, we're marrying people who, who are nominal Christians, meaning by title, they're a Christian because they live in America and we're supposed to be a Christian nation even though we're not behaving like it. So I'm American, I must be Christian because that was the predominant religion of America. Well, guess what? That's decreasing, okay? And atheism and agnosticism is on the rise, all right? So like someone says, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, it, that, that has to mean more than going to Christmas Eve services and, and, and Easter Sunday services. You know, I, it, I'm, why am I so strong on this? Because I care about your salvation and your eternal destiny. I also care about your future marriage and who you marry. You don't wanna find someone who says they're Christian by title, but not by lifestyle. So, <laughs> I was looking for someone who practiced and demonstrated her faith in God as a natural outflow of who she is on the inside. It just came out because it's who she is. I was looking for someone who chased after God and put God first in her life and I could barely keep up because I had asthma and I couldn't keep up with her. No, nah, sure. <laughs> But here's the thing, and, and seriously though, if I was second that was okay because God would make her the woman of my dreams. In other words, if God is first in her life, I'll be second. I'm cool with that because God is gonna make her exactly who she needs to be for me. And you know what? It was, for my wife and I, it was good that I was, that God was first in my life because God was making me who I'm supposed to be for her. And that was before we got engaged. Just so you know, I, I saw my wife at college, kind of like an aisle like this, and I, I was uh, a sophomore at uh, Valley Forge, University of Valley Forge now, Christian college, studying ministry, and I'm, I'm at the table welcoming all the freshmen. She was a freshman, and I saw her, I was like, oh wow, she's beautiful, wow. And uh, you know, well, the first thing that attracted me to her was her smile and her joy. And I was a fool, I was like, I, I got to know that she was, uh, she was there for soccer. She was early. She played, she's really good at so soccer and basketball. She's better than me at both, just so you know. And uh, so, so I, I said, hey, you know, I should introduce you to my roommate. He's, he's like a soccer star, you know. I was like already trying to match make. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and later on, I found out that she was like more interested in me than my roommate. And I, you know, I was like, oh, okay, cool, you know. And one day, um, I saw her in the, in, the, in the cafeteria for dinner, and she walked in, and I was with my guys, and I was like, I'm gonna date that girl right there. See her? I'm gonna date her. And they're like, yeah, right. Well, uh, we're married, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Praise God. What's interesting is, is, what attracted her, um, she was attracted to me because she saw me go after God at the altar during chapels at our college. And I was attracted to her because I saw the joy of the Lord in her. 
So let me get into that. What does a godly person look like? Because we're kind of getting, you know, some mixed messages on what a Christian is nowadays. So let's look for a godly person who demonstrates this. And this is what we're teaching our kids. So Connor and Ava, make sure you're listening. You got your pen and paper out. He's in the room. We already started teaching this. And this is what we're teaching our kids to be and then what they should look for. Okay, now this goes for all of us, okay, that are, that are currently single or, or maybe searching. Number one, I'm teaching my children to look for a worshiper of God in all of life, not just at church. And I'm teaching them to do the same thing. I'm teaching my kids to live for God, not just at church, but throughout the week. Genuinely follow and imitate Jesus 1 John 2, 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. When you're looking, when you're searching, does the person resemble Jesus in the way they live and talk and act? And do they do it consistently or only when you're around? Secondly, a person who knows God and his word. Look for someone who does the same. Someone who knows God and his word and even obeys, especially obeys the word of God. Because these are the blueprints for how to love one another and, and to care for one another and come together and stay together. These are the blueprints for that and how to raise a family. So does your person you're looking at know the word of God? I had a professor in college say that he would, he would tell couples to break up if, they're, if the man or the woman was not reading scripture on a regular basis. And I even think he said daily basis. Why? Because we need God's word for life to guide us. We're lost without God's word, my friends. Thirdly, look for a person who loves God and loves others. Loving God is doing the first two things. You worship God with your whole life, not just when you come to church, how you handle everything. Loving God is getting to know him in a personal relationship with him, reading his word, applying his word to your life. So a person who loves God and does that, but also loves others the way God calls us to love people. What attracted me to my wife was her love and kindness towards people, but also the love of her family. I remember when they came to visit us at college and Rachel and I were dating, they, they called us and said, hey, why don't you join us? Uh, we're gonna take you out to eat for dinner. Go ahead and invite your roommates to come out too. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I called my roommate, who was the guy I was talking about Rachel meeting, which was funny. I was like, should I bring him? Yeah, no, I did, I did. And so we went out to eat together and they paid for our bill. And I was like, oh man, like these people like love people. Like they care, they're generous because we're broke college students. Lord knows I couldn't afford that bill and they paid for everyone at that table. So when I saw that, I saw not just that, but other things, the way that all of her family came to visit her, her brothers came with the mom and dad to visit her and we all, we all ate together. I said, this could be a woman who loves her family the same way, who loves me and loves her kids the same way. I want that kind of person in my life. That's what attracted me to my wife was her love for family and for strangers and everyone at that college. Interesting, right? An important metric for looking for someone. Fourth, I was looking for someone who is full of the Holy Spirit, demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. Someone with self-control, gentleness, patience, kindness, love, faithfulness, joy. And I've already said this, every time I saw my, my, my girlfriend or every time I saw Rachel at the time, uh, she was always smiling. She had the joy of the Lord in her and so did I. And that was very eye-opening to me that even on hard days, she was still happy. Uh, in difficult times in, in college, she had joy in her. Things weren't robbing her of her joy because her joy came from Jesus, not circumstances. Not just the good times, but even the bad times, I saw joy in her life. Do you see why this is important to date for a while before you just like emotionally get pulled in and go, oh, she's the one, he's the one. You need to look for these kind of things. And lastly, I'm just, I'm just focusing on spiritual things today, okay? 
I, we could, I could put up more content online on our articles of you know, things to look for naturally as well, not just spiritually. But let me, let me hit this last point that I think is really important. And I had to take time to explain this in the last service just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, lastly, look for a person who knows God's purpose for them. When someone knows who they are, when someone knows that they are a child of God and they know God's word, they're most likely gonna know why they are here on earth. And they're gonna have more focus and ambition and they're gonna be consistent and they're gonna know too that, okay, maybe, not, maybe you're not full-time ministry, but you know what we all are? We're all full-time disciples. We're all full-time followers of Jesus. It's not part-time. It's not just on Sunday mornings. So I was looking for someone who knew that their purpose was to love and serve God and help other people go to heaven. I was looking for someone like that. And I noticed that in my girlfriend and the person that I was getting to know, I said, man, she's a full-time disciple. She cares about people. She cares about their eternal destiny. She knew her purpose. You know why? She knew her creator. She was full of the spirit. She was in her word. She loved God. She did all those things. And I, I started seeing the fruit of God come out of her life. And I was like, this is someone that, is, that is, knows her purpose, knows that God created her on purpose. She's gonna look at her job, her nine to five job as a place to reach people, not just try to survive. And I get it. Sometimes, you know, you, you get into a job and it's not your favorite place to be. But you know what? God could have appointed you there for that time because someone needs to go to heaven yeah. in that place. Yeah. Amen. I want you to notice, though, that this is what a godly person looks like, a worshiper, someone who knows the word and lives by it, a person who loves God, loves others, someone who demonstrates the fruit of the spirit, you know, signs of the spirit in their life, the presence of God. And lastly, they know their purpose in life, okay? If you're in this room today and this, you know, this sermon, you need to just hear this one part, I wanna encourage you, if you don't know your purpose in life, get to know your creator. Get to know him. He's got an amazing purpose for you. Okay, and I know one thing, he has saved you so that you can help other people come to Christ as well, all right? And so that's, that's clear in scripture. We don't, we don't have to wait on the Lord for that answer. Notice that none of this had to really do with physical attributes or money, okay? Now, listen, I, or anything, I'm just giving you two examples, okay? Now, did I see my, my girlfriend or that, that girl I didn't know yet? And I go, oh man, she's pretty. Yeah, I did. That's normal, that's, that's the basic law of attraction, okay? That's okay. Um, but I didn't make it about her looks and she definitely didn't make it about my looks. I wasn't her type, she said. <laughs> oh, oh. I was like, what does that mean? Yeah. I, I, I got it, I got it. So, I, you know, her testimony is really cool. She was living a different life and God saved her and now the type she wants is a godly person. That's, that's why. Praise the Lord. You know, both are fleeting. Physical attributes, money is fleeting. Here, here's, what I, here's what I believe. That the richest person in the room is the one who knows God. The richest person in the room. They know God, they know all they need for life. Okay, money's gonna come and go. God can bless you later. God will get you through difficult times. Now, now, listen, I'm not saying go and marry someone who could care less about managing their finances. That is problematic. <laughs> okay, don't take me, don't go, don't go putting this online saying, Pastor Ryan says, no, no, that's not what I mean, okay? You need to care about how someone manages their finances, just so you know. Before, you know, online banking got popular, my wife was keeping a checkbook. I was like, oh, that's definitely old school, right? Receipts and checkbook to, to show what she still has in the bank account. And then when we got engaged, I'm still trying to figure out how this went down, babe. All right. She hates when I talk about her, by the way. Uh, when we got engaged, someone brought up 
I was trying to figure this out the first service, but someone brought up, would you rather have a nice ring or furniture when you get married? Now, gentlemen, you want to be careful if you ever ask that. <laughs> I think we, did we have a conversation about it? Because we knew we were going to get married and we, yeah, okay. Yeah. I had, yeah, I, I went to Zales, you know. I didn't go to Jared's, I went to Zales. <laughs> and I got like that, you know, I got a reasonable price ring because she said, I'd rather have furniture than a really nice ring. I said, yes, I got myself a good one. I got myself a good one. No offense, if you like nice things, that's all good. But in my context, you have to understand, I'm a pastor and a youth pastor at that. So I wasn't coming in to lots of money, you know what I'm saying? So I couldn't afford a $10,000 ring. And she was like, I'm not so much about that. I would like to have furniture. And I was like, me too. I would like to sit on a couch when we're watching TV. <laughs> so <laughs> praise the Lord. So, I mean, again, that's the more practical side of what you should look for in someone. But I wanted to focus on the godly thing. But let me remind you, by the way, though, that the Bible talks about money a lot. And the Bible teaches us to be good stewards with our finances so that we can be a good husband and wife that takes care of our family and secures their future. There, that, that is in scripture. The scripture talks about giving and tithing and making sure God gets the first fruits and all that stuff. And then we take care of everything else. That is what scripture says because it teaches good stewardship. If you can steward your finances, you can steward your family and vice versa. It's a practice of constantly stewarding what God has blessed you with. Because doesn't it all belong to God? Even the person that you're interested in, they're actually God's creation. So better be careful how you treat that person. All right. These are just a few things that we're raising our kids in for the future. Keyword future. They ain't dating right now. Just so you know. And that brings us to some common questions. And I feel bad. I, I put a really heavy one at the end and it got kind of frosty in the room at nine o'clock, a little icy. It got tense. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it at the end. Let me just focus on a few common questions here. How involved should parents be in helping their kids grow up and find a spouse? It brings up some questions, doesn't it? Like if we're gonna talk about finding a godly person, well parents, we gotta consider how involved are we, all right? And kids, you need to consider the fact that your parents are supposed to be involved. Let me show you a video clip of, of why I believe parents need to be involved. I think would make a perfect husband, Karen. Well, a man that provides a lot of money, loves horses, and <laughs> will uh, let you have 22 kids and doesn't put up a fight. <laughs> Who do you think you'll be when you grow up? A nun. <laughs> In case you missed that, she gave her a list of things and then she, and he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, he, and she said, a nun. I was like, well, that's... Yeah, so, now she's a little young, but that's why we need to get involved, parents. <laughs> Let me be brief on this first part, uh, and I hate to do that because of time, though. And my, my notes are online. I've kind of put my heart out when I do my notes, just so you know. Um, so be, be nice. But uh, in all reality, this begins in the upbringing of what you teach and pass down to your children. So they would choose according to the word of God. So how, how involved should we be? We already are involved because of what we teach our kids from the time they're born to the time they go off on their own. We're supposed to be involved already. Parents are supposed to be part of this process. And even more so now, now I need you to hear me out, okay? Because we love everyone here at Calvary, okay? But God has clear standards when it comes to relationships. We live in a world now where we have to be intentional about teaching our kids even basic things like marriage is between a man and a woman, okay? And now it's getting even more complicated because you have to explain to them that there's now transsexual 
and transgender issues. So now we actually have to explain that to our kids so that they don't choose wrongly moving forward. And that's scary, isn't it? But this is the reality, and the Bible doesn't affirm those two things in marriage. The Bible doesn't affirm that, okay? God created us in his image. Male and female, he created us, okay? And that's what it's supposed to be in marriage. We have to be involved in teaching our kids that from the beginning. Even if they struggle to know who they are and their identity, we simply guide them and go, this is how God has made you. This is who you are. We can't assume our kids know. We have to intentionally disciple these matters. I will be in my home. Uh, I will be involved in my, my kids' lives, especially my daughter's. <laughs> as I polish my shotgun when the first boy comes over. Uh, yes. Sit down, son. This is a 12 gauge. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I am not, I'm not violent, don't take that wrong. Just want you to know that this is a gun, so no. And I, that's my daughter, and I cherish her, so. I hope you like your fingers, because I will break them if you, no, it's your, no it's your. oh my goodness. That's gonna go on YouTube, it's gonna go viral, I'm gonna be, yeah. <laughs> now in the perfect world, your kids would come to you and tell you, I'm dating someone, I even messed up on that. Um, we're trying to build a relationship where they do that, right, because you already started having real conversations a while ago. And so you're building this open transparency and communication that you care and that, you know, I'm here if you need to talk about it. And if they don't, you could always take them out to lunch and drop some wisdom on them. And you can also cancel their cell phone subscription. <laughs> and if it gets desperate, we can go into pre-arranged marriages like they did in the, old, in the Bible. You do, you just, no. I'm just joking, I'm just, um, but hey, if you get desperate, no, sure. <laughs> but remember this. What to look for in a spouse is something we've already started teaching and demonstrating with our own marriages. My kids are watching me and my wife and how we love each other and treat each other. We've already started teaching. We're already involved. Just make sure you're intentional at the same time. And then here's a, here's a tricky one. Okay, I don't have any advice for you on this one because my kids are 11 and 14, but now the trend is people are waiting until the 30s to get married. Parents, they're adults now. There's only so much involvement you can have, okay? You just gotta pray that what you taught them before continues to be their views in their adulthood, okay? What do I do? Here's another common question. What do I do if I become a believer but my spouse is still an unbeliever? In other words, you marry, both of you are unbelievers, which means you're actually technically equally yoked because you're both unbelievers, but one of you gets saved. What do you do? Here's what scripture says in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 14. Go ahead and bring that up for me, if you will. Now, I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. So this is the wisdom that God's giving uh, Paul. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman, oh, come back for me. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, there you go, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Okay, so God saved them while they were married to an unbeliever, so now you should remain there. However, if you wanna read more on that, go to 1 Corinthians 7, because there, there are other circumstances where that might become, uh, there might be different things that need to take place. So in other words, you got married, both of you are unbelievers, now one of you are, will stay, because you could bring Jesus into that entire home. That's what Paul is trying to say. What if I'm a believer, and the person I'm pursuing isn't a believer, can I try to get them saved so that we will be equally yoked? Well, we call that missionary dating. 
And if you're not a good evangelist or missionary right now, I don't know if I would recommend this. <laughs> However, on rare occasions, there has been times where people have pursued someone who's not a believer and uh, by the grace of God, they got saved. But my friends, that's an exception to the rule. The word of God says, do not be equally, or do not be unequally yoked. The word of God would not suggest that. The word of God would not suggest that you try to get them saved because you like them and you don't want to lose them. The word of God would say, start in the beginning only looking for a believer. Start there. Okay, now some of you have testimonies of how God has saved you through that. Well, praise the Lord. We need to go back to the word of what God designed and intended and that's what he said to do. All right, What's more important, let me ask you this question, your relationship together or that person's eternal relationship with God? What I recommend is, is that you separate for the reason of making sure that you are being faithful to God to be equally yoked with someone and that perhaps God will get their attention when you're separated. And if you're supposed to come back together, God will bring you back together. That's painful though. That is painful, but that would be a proper way of doing that to honor God. Now, here's the thing, you gotta give that time and seasons because that person could be coming running back to you because of attachment, emotional attachment, physical attachment, all those other factors. I mean, we're, that's, that's a whole sermon in itself, okay? And these are things that would guide in, in, in discipleship, mentoring, or counseling, all right? Does it work though? It does, praise God. People have separated and the Lord got a hold of the other person and they generally came back together and they've been married ever since. Praise God for that. So, yeah. Okay, here's the one that got really frosty and icy. Look, I'm just the messenger, okay? Start the car. Now, this is more common, no pun intended, than I've seen. It's, it's, it's increasing. It has been for a long time. And the church hasn't really talked about this and it needs to be said, okay? Is it okay to live together and share the same bed before marriage? To no. know, to know. And there's a basic reason why in scripture, the Bible says that marriage, that the man leaves his father and mother to become united with his wife. So you, when you get married, then you leave your household. That's naturally how it took place. Okay, naturally, they got married, then they left their mom and dad and lived after a year of betrothal, okay, a year of being separate, not, you know, not living in a home together. They, they built up their lives, they got prepared for the ceremony, and then they got married, and then they left their mother and father's homes, and they consummated the marriage that night on the wedding night. That's how it took place. That still works. Let me share why, okay? Okay. Um, and I'll also put this here too. I think we all know where that temptation will lead us if we're sharing the same house in the same bed. I think we all know. Okay, premarital sex, uh, sexual immorality is sex outside of the marriage covenant according to the Bible. That's sinful, that's wrong, that's not what God intended. And one of the reasons why it's important is because, oops, you have a baby. Okay, now you're not even married and guess who gets to leave? Guess who doesn't take care of the kid? Guess who's no, a no-show in his life or her life? Now I know that can happen in marriage too, unfortunately, I get that. I understand that. But the way God intended it was we, we get to know each other, we are engaged, we get married, then we share that covenant bed together Okay, and then we build a family from there. That's case, simple point from scripture. Sounds old school, but it still works. Still works. Um, I'm, I'm thinking this, that if you're living in the same house and you've been together for quite some time, I guess I would ask the question as a pastor and counselor, what are you waiting for? Are you afraid? Is there fear involved in that? Well, partly it's because you're not obeying God. 
And I'm talking to Christians here, unchristian, you know, non-Christian people, they're going to do whatever they want. But as Christians, we're supposed to honor God with every relationship. We're supposed to obey his word. So I'm talking to Christians here. If you're in the same home and you love each other and you're ready to live together, I really highly recommend you get married as soon as possible. Okay? Um, but I would also recommend premarital counseling so that you make sure you do have a true godly person in your home. Can I get real real quick? That's already in question because you're both living in sin. See, see how it got icy, you know, first service now? Sinners, uh, you know, Christians, we're, we're not perfect. We've, we sin, but we want to make sure we have a godly partner so we can raise godly children and build a godly kingdom here on earth, okay? So let me close with this. And, and again, I know that's hard. I know there's been financial reasons why. You know, we can't afford two different places. There's nowhere to live. I get all that. But try to make a way, find a way, okay? If you gotta barricade yourself in the basement in that same place, do something, okay, whatever. But you gotta show God that you care about doing life his way, all right? And he will bless you for that. Let me close with this. Singles, young adults, teenagers, you can spare yourself a lot of painful experiences if you follow God's blueprints. And I think some of us could say amen to that in this room. Amen. May, yeah. <laughs> Married couples, well, you're stuck with the one you have. So, you know, you know just, <laughs> no, nah, sure. I'm joking, I'm joking. I kid. Now, I pray today that you learn that you can be this person for your spouse. You can be this godly person you need to be. We learned last week that we're not perfect. We're trying to build a family with imperfections in our own lives. So there's going to be imperfections. So you got to be gracious and patient with each other, okay? But we also got to work together with God, all right, and not try to do marriage on our own. I think there's a lesson for us married couples stay godly. Let me explain that. Stay faithful to God so the marriage stays strong because strong believers in the Lord have married other strong believers, but the spouse or one spouse or both have not continued in the faith and the marriage and family have suffered because of it. So start with God and stay with God. Start with God and continue with God. Okay? Okay. Please know that, that even strong, godly people can go wayward because they take their eyes off of God. You have to stay strong there. You have to be willing to admit you're not doing well. You got to get counsel. You got to start before it gets worse. Please don't wait to go to counseling or a pastor when things are already falling apart. Sooner than later, please seek God's word. Seek God's help and let him build you back up. Get back to his blueprints. In a nutshell... When we're a godly man or woman, when a godly man or woman come together, you'll see God's blueprints in the same way. The parents will be united in their biblical worldview, love one another with the love of God, and pass down the truth and love of God to their kids. A family God's way will help build the kingdom of God and lead other families into salvation and eternal life. Why don't we stand together? Amen. Thanks for hanging around a little longer to hear some questions to a lot of, an, uh, a lot of answers to questions I get all the time. And I appreciate you hanging out on that. There's many other questions that are probably going to come in. We do have a website link for you to do that. Uh, just know that we only have so much time in our lives to get back to those questions. But on our website, calvarydover.org, you can see a link to drop your questions in about this whole series, and we're going to try to cover some of those as we preach. Some of them are already going to be covered. So let's pray. God, we're so grateful for your design. Thank you, Lord, for your blueprints, your word. And God, we want to honor you. None of us in this room just want to be rebellious on purpose in this way. We just need guidance, and some of us have learned the wrong way from this world, and Maybe we had different examples in our lives. And so, God, we just need this series to teach us the basic truth of your word. 
for marriage and family and for raising kids. God, I pray today that we'd be humble to receive what we need to receive. I pray, Lord, that you would show that you bless those who honor your word. And God, I pray that you would continue to make our marriages stronger, Lord, so that we don't go down the wrong path or separate or divorce. Lord, that we don't hurt our families in any way, our kids. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the marriages here, Lord. God, I pray for restoration for those who have gone through those experiences, Lord. I pray for a comeback and a, and a second chance, Lord. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just work in powerful ways in those marriages or those who have been um, or in a broken home right now. God, I just pray that you would heal and begin to restore. Lord, we pray for our young people and that those who are single. Lord, I just pray, God, you give them wisdom and guidance and discernment to be able to see true godly people. And Lord, most of all, may we be godly people so that, God, we not only just attract the right people, but we also help people see your goodness and your glory. We love you. We thank you for this message. Be with us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 